Well, good after whenever. Good to see you. Good to be seen by you. Great to have you joining us with, uh, with us today for In Deep as we dig a little deeper into some of the topics that we've been talking about. And today we're going to be talking about uh, an extension to the sermon that I did a couple of weeks ago called uh, Boy Swallows Universe. And the basic concept of this is that we have, as believers, we have ingested the universe as Christ comes to live inside of us. The one who made all of existence is now dwells within us. And that produces a huge amount of growing pains. It changes our lives in ways that maybe we are unexpected, but we have to adapt. We have to, we have to grow along with Christ as he teaches us new ways to live, new ways to be, new w- lenses through which to see life in the world and even our enemies. You see, there's real dynamic changes. I want to start off by telling you a little story. I, uh, uh, it, when I was a, a young man and attending Bible college, uh, I was really interested in keeping my costs as low as possible. And part of that was because I was working for Teen Challenge, paid almost nothing, and just trying to minimize my expenses. So when an opportunity came up to live in the Bible college in as kind of like this uh, maintenance slash nighttime security guard position, I jumped at it. They basically they said you can just grab one of the rooms. So there's like a storage room where they had all the sort of, you know, papers and stationery and that kind of stuff. And it's quite small, but there was enough room for me to roll out a mat and I could sleep on that mat in my sleeping bag overnight and basically for free. So I thought this is amazing. And I just did a bit of painting, a bit of maintenance, fixing things. And that's how I covered things. But at night I was supposed to be like this live-in security person. Well, one night I'm uh, sleeping in the Bible college. It's late, it's like two in the morning or something. And I hear this like rushing of people running past the room that I'm sleeping in. And I'm like, look at the clock, it's two o'clock. I usually even think that they might have rattled on the door handle of the room that I was in. Uh, Like obviously there were people who broken into the building and like a pretty lousy security dog, I didn't even notice until they were actually running around pillaging the place. So I I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm security, I got to get up, I got to do something. So I looked around the room that I was in for something that could act as a weapon. So uh, a couple of days before, I'd been shopping and had bought a, a brand new torque wrench. And if, if you don't know what a torque wrench is, it's, it's a way of uh, when you're in doing automotive things, like Frex fixing an engine, there are some bolts that have to be tightened to an exact amount of tightness, and that's called torque. And a torque wrench measures how tight you're tightening things. But essentially, it was about a foot and a half long and solid metal, like almost a perfect weapon. So I grab this thing out of its case and I open the door and as I'm about to step out into the hallway, I hear the Holy Spirit speak to me and he said, what are you going to do with that? Now that's, that kind of struck me like I was thinking, because in that moment I realized that he was, he was pointing out something that I should have fundamentally registered, but I hadn't registered and that is now that we're part of the family of God, and now that I'm filled with the Spirit, now that I'm one of God's children, we don't bash people up. Like, that's not something that we do. And so I thought, I don't know. But then I thought, well, I'll just keep going. Well, as I'm, I'm going out in search of these people, it was two stories, so I, I had to go upstairs. As I ran around the corner, I hear another set of commotion upstairs. And so here's a little piece of story I haven't told you yet. There was somebody else that used to sleep in the building um, at the, uh, when I was there. And he didn't do it all the time, but he kind of occasionally dropped in. He was a very unusual guy. He wasn't like homeless in a sense of he's got no money and no place to live. He'd, he had lots of money. Uh, he just didn't like to have a place to live. He, he just was kind of unusual. He'd just travel and do different jobs, different places, and he'd show up for months at a time to do things. But he was actually an exceptionally amazing guy he could um he his specialty was stone masonry he uh, like an artistic way he could take a piece of granite and turn it into a perfect circle he could he could you know do artistic creations and he would get big commissions to do those kinds of things paying him like tons and tons of money and it was a very like not many people had his skill anymore sort of an old world kind of thing 
So he was a really successful guy, but he was just really eccentric, really unusual, and he just didn't want to have a place to live, so he would just kind of, uh, you know, drop his clothes uh, it, at one place and buy new stuff, and he would just, you know, crash it, because he was part of the church. He'd, he'd sleep in the Bible college, and, and, uh, and that was all cool. So he slept upstairs on the couch. As I'm coming upstairs, I hear this enormous crash. Uh, it was clearly doors being smashed. And when I got to the top of the stairs, here was this guy, you know, a 60-year-old, sort of smallish-looking guy, standing there very peacefully, kind of going, huh, huh, that was weird. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, it's interesting. I, I heard these guys walking around the college, so I, I came out, and when I found him here in the foyer, I, I said to him, oh, God bless you. And they turned around and looked at me, then their eyes lit up and they jumped back as they pointed behind me, and just behind him was a wall, there was nothing there. They pointed behind me and said, look at the size of those. And then they turned and smashed their way out of the door, like inward opening doors had been smashed out because they were petrified of whatever they'd just seen. Now, my speculation is, they, they probably saw this man's angels that have been assigned to protect him, like we're all given angels. And the lesson that I learned out of that was, like the Lord was saying to me, Joe, we don't need foot and a half lengths of, of steel to defend ourselves anymore. We, we don't need physical violence to make things happen. We have new spiritual solutions to the life that you're facing. 16 foot tall giant angels are more effective deterrents than foot and a half pieces of steel. And there's a lot of things about our lives as they change from the natural, unborn again, human way of living to the in, in Christ, filled with the spirit and having Christ in you way of, of doing life. It's very different. And as we change from one way of living to the new way of living, we have to go through the pain of adopting these new things. We hurt because what we've been, what we've had, no longer fits us. And it's inappropriate for us to stay in the same childlike clothing that we had at the beginning. We have to move and grow. And the point is, there's no going back. This is why it's so interesting to me that God disciplines his household and his family far more than he disciplines the world. He, he's not trying to train them to be good children of God because they're not children of God. He is disciplining and conforming his household and it, it hurts. It hurts as God refuses to allow us to go back to child, childish ways and creates tension in our lives so that we are forced to adopt his ways and to live up to these new things. Now, the one time in the, in the Jesus story of Jesus, as Jesus is leading his disciples, in John chapter six, it gets to this point where Jesus has done an extraordinary amount of, no, of miracles and it's kind of a cr attracted a crowd of people who are just sort of there for the benefits. And Jesus is like, this is not just about what you can get out of me and then keep your old life. If you're going to follow me, you've got to make significant choices. And he starts talking about how we have to eat his flesh, drink his blood. We have to unite completely with him. Not this sort of, you know, pretend or halfway or even just sort of, well, tell me, Jesus, a few ideas and I'll choose between them. We've got to commit. And so it says in John chapter 6, verse 66, interesting 666, it says, after this, this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, hey, do you also want to go away as well? And then Peter answered him and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Peter expresses this perfectly. You and I know we could go back to all of that other stuff, those other worldly ways, those worldly values, those, the worldly solutions, all of those immature, imperfect things things but we found in jesus christ life he has the words of life and what he has to offer is far better than anything we've found in this world 
but we have to make the choice. And that's why Jesus gives them the dignity of the choice. Do you want to leave me too? And Peter's like, we're in too deep already. We know that you're the only one who's got answers to life. So when Jesus was talking, he talked to them about how the work that he was going to do in them, this work of the kingdom, was going to be like yeast. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, it says he told them a parable. and He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid or mixed into three measures of flour until it was all leavened. So what Christ is saying is when you let me in, I seep into every area. I leaven the lot. I I touch it all and it all gets infected with this reality of Christ in you. Now what I want to tell you, my friends, is that you are being affected. by If you've welcomed Christ into your heart, it's affecting you. It's touching every area. You might have thought, well, I need Jesus to help me with this issue in my life. And you find in that he's actually putting pressure on other issues in your life you didn't even know you had or you weren't ready for him to deal with. But the truth is, he's not going to stop until he's affecting everything about us because he has such supernatural power at work within him. It's exactly what he asked to be able to do. In John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer is that he said to the Father in verse 22 of chapter 17, he said, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you loved me. Now the the word one is constantly interpreted in our kind of time as sort of this idea around unity. It's not about unity, it's about becoming one, like a married partner, partners, they need to become one flesh, they need to become one person. And that's what Christ is saying. He's saying, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But I want you to be in us as well, and I want to be in you. So this is the miracle of new birth, is that we enter into the the life of God. We become part of God. But not only that, but God also comes and dwells in us, which I like to say it's like a boy swallowing the universe, based off the title of this great Australian book. Now, in the, in the book, he's talking about taking everything in, but that's not what, this, what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about taking Christ within us and producing those changes in us. And so we're in 1 John chapter 2. He actually encourages us to go full in on the choice, to grab hold of that. In a sense, yeah, God made the world. God made all those resources. God made all of the things that you've been using, money and time and power and influence and, and things to make you feel happy and things to make you feel more important and all of these worldly things. Yeah, God made all of those things, but don't trade those things for the God who made them. God make the all of the universe. He makes everything that we need So why do you depend on the things of this world? It's like he's saying, you can have either God or the things that God made, but if you depend on those things, you become worldly. Now in 1 John, he says there's a choice. It's a choice between the world or the love of the Father, which is what Jesus prayed that we would have, the love of the Father. And so he says in verse 15 of chapter 2, he says, don't love the world or the things of the world in the world, If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. What is the will of God? The will of God is to have Christ in us and to live in that in that immersed reality of having Jesus alive and powerful within us. But here in 1 John, he's not making a threat like, well, if you love the world, God won't love you. No, God already loves you and you're never going to switch that love off, no matter what you do. But did you allow the love of the Father to be in you? Are you choosing to let God solve your problems? Let God be your reward. Let God be the answer. And to follow and live according to the things that he desires Or are you taking up the worldly things, the pride of life, of power, possessions, the things that that you can use to live in this planet, but they're not godly. 
And so we are all making this choice. And the truth is, God's love for you is so solid and reliable that you no longer need the things of the world. It's like saying, I need this foot and a half piece of steel to solve problems. When the reality is God has got a host of angels and all of his power and his love and his, his amazing ability to create everything you need and you're relying on some earthly lump of metal. God doesn't need it and you don't need it. You need him. And so I want to give us some advice about it. Colossians chapter 2 gives us this warning. Paul is concerned for the people of of Colossae and all of Laodicea. But he says this to them in chapter two. He says, I don't want, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who've not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all of the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now, here's the the basic problem. Paul knows that people, even even having heard about Christ, even having had their sins forgiven for being born again, we are such religious thinkers that we still think there's something I need to do do to make the good things happen. I'm the one who produces them. And so he's saying, we can get easily led astray into all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of way of thinking, all kinds of human behavior that we think are making the miraculous happen, are having the the power of God occur to us. We kept a festival, we kept a law, we did things the right way. Now all of those things are kind of like a human way of trying to think we're the ones that create the grace of God. We're the ones that create the activity of God. But that's just not true. Christ is in us. That's what Paul keeps saying. All you need to grow up is is just grow up into the fullness of it. Don't try to make the miracle happen and by going to do it, to make it happen. Don't leave the miracle. And that's what I want to say to you. Like the Galatians were warned in this way. He said, are you so foolish in Galatians chapter 3? Have you begun in the spirit? You're not apparent to perfect it by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if it was indeed in vain? And he says, so guys, you're being distracted away from Jesus Christ in whom are all of the riches of God. What other riches are you going to get? You're going to make those happen with your human effort? Dwell in Christ. Focus on what Jesus has done. Realize that Christ is in you and that Christ in you can solve any problem, any issue, any guilt, any any falsehood, any weakness. Christ is there. Now, second to that, we need to recognize that the world's ways aren't our ways anymore. So Colossians, he goes on and he teaches the people and he says in verse chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, he said, in these you too once walked. He's saying, you, you used to do this. He says, when you were living among them, the people of the world. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you've put off that old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. It is being renewed. Does he say you have to make it happen? No, it's happening within you. He's just saying participate with him by leaving aside the old. Those words that he's talking about, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, those things you might say, well, that's, you know, that's just for some R-rated movie or, or you know, that's for the tough people who live down on the streets. And, and I never really think that way. Now listen, when humans try to protect and preserve their own lives so that they can have what they want, that's what we become like. We become competitive. Those other people are not just, you know, the people that we just kind of love and put up. No, we, we kind of compete with them. We make them look bad. We, we, we act in ways of self-interest. And all of those schemings and plannings and working become because people are afraid that they're not going to have enough. 
that they won't have what, they're good, what you need. And maybe you're like that. You're like, well, how will I get what I need? How will I get what I want? If, unless I kind of jump the gun, unless I you know, work to make sure that I've got what I need. You see, Paul's, Paul is saying, guys, you don't need that stuff. God loves you. He's promised to provide for you. Christ lives in you. You've got an answer for all of the issues of life that come to your door. Why would you leave that? He's saying, you need to put down your metal bar and you need to pick up the resources of the Holy Spirit. And he is enough. He is enough to handle every issue of every person for everything that happens in life for all generations. So leave the old ways behind. Don't try to live in the old ways of vengeance and unforgiveness and anger and competition. Leave those things aside. Take up the way of Christ. He trusted the Father. Now, third, you need to understand that you are able to get help. In in Ephesians, he encourages the people in their growth by telling them about the gifts that God has given them. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of, of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Uh, Let's just focus on those last words. He wants us to grow up into what is inside of us. Christ is in us. We need to grow up into the fullness of that reality because Christ was able, and that means that you are able, as you mature in him, as you recognize who, who Christ is. And we're growing up in it, but you're not alone in the process. What he's saying is, you've been given gifts and those gifts are are jesus working through the lives of others to teach you to lead you to instruct you to help you because maturing in christ and getting a full understanding of that is a complicated thing and you're going to struggle along your way so if you're at a place in your life where you're like okay well I'm really struggling leaving this thing behind, this, this old way of living, worldly way of living. I'm really struggling to leave that. Then what you probably need is you need Jesus to work through one of the gifts he's given to you in a pastor, in a teacher, in a shepherd, in a, in a perfect, in a prophet, in an apostle, in an evangelist that can help you to get into your new maturity. God has not left you alone, but he has provided gifts of himself in others for example like i am or the pastors of your churches those people are there to help equip you so that you can become mature now fourth we don't expect the world to reflect our new image in the book of uh, first john again we go back to he says in chapter three as he remember he encouraged us to go into the love of the Father and leave the, th- leave the kind of the help or the hurtful things that the world does. Leave those things because God's love is better. God, what God is doing in us is better. And what God has for us is far, far better. So just stay in his love. Stick to his love. Well, in chapter 3, he gives us another way to see ourselves. In chapter 3, he says, <clears throat> see what kind of love the Father has given us. That we... We, we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is as it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. And this is God speaking to you right now. That God is trying to tell you that you are his child. He says it in that passage three times. And and he says that's what God's love means. Is that you get to become one of his children. And he's going to live in you. And he's also purified you. You are pure. Now the trans. The translation from where you are today into what you already are is part of that growth process. But, but listen what he says. He says the world is not going to be able to reflect back encouragement to you. 
because the world does not know God. It de- how can it reflect God when it doesn't know God? And this is a really, really important point. You and I, if you're a human being, you are a social learner. We learn things from the people in our environment, the people that we come to love and trust and depend on, create for us the image of who we are. They help us understand who we are. When your parents believed in you or gave instructions to you or, or showed comfort to you or, or provided the necessities for life for you, they were sending you messages about yourself, about who you are, how important you are. And if you got a bad experience growing up, which nobody got a perfect one, and some people got it horrible and some people got it adequate, but nobody got it 100% because the world can't represent God's love. But when your parents tried to do their best, love and care and support you, and they were sending messages about your identity to you. You're valuable. You're, you're loved. You're, you're important. You've, you've got dignity. You've got worth. That's what they, that's what they do. But that is such an imperfect thing. So what, what God does is he encourages us to step away from just looking at our current selves and instead to fixate on the love that he has for us and the image of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, in that moment when Christ comes back, when, when he calls time on this period of existence and he decides new heaven, new earth time, Judgment time. It's all over. This human story of of this planet is going to be done. When he calls that moment and Jesus comes back and you, your, your spiritual person, sees Christ as he really is, you will identify that's the Jesus that's in me. That's the image that I bear. And when you see him as he truly is, you become like he truly is. And that's why I think it's so important, again and again in Scripture, we're told to focus in on Jesus, not as somebody foreign to us, somebody that we can never aspire to be like, somebody who's just sort of this, you know, you know, cosmic power that's going to, you know, one day judge everything and he rules everything, runs everything. No, he, the Bible wants you to see Christ prayed that he would be in you and that you would get your image of who you are as a reflection of him. So don't look to the world for the signals of who you are. They will, they can't only, they, they have to lie because they don't know the truth. Look to who you are in Christ. And the more you look to who you are in Christ, you will find the ways of living, the former ways, the earthly ways, just drop off. Like I did when I realized that there was so much more. If there's ever trouble now, I'm not going to pick up a piece of steel because I don't want to hurt anybody and I would actually rather be hurt by people because I'm not a violent man and I don't think violence solves anything. I've, I've learned that there are spiritual things about restoring people, about helping people, loving people. And so I've done that because I realized that's what Jesus is like. And then I realized that's who I am too in Christ. Who are you in Christ? Jesus wants you to grow up in him and mature. So there's going to be pain along the way. But as you do, you're going to find there's a huge amount of relief as you realize that Christ has all you need. So God bless you, and we'll see you next time.